So to begin, I'm going to actually um, share with you an acknowledgement of country that we uh, share here in Melbourne. I'm speaking to you today from Melbourne and in particular from the Melbourne Archdiocese of Catholic Schools, my place of work. And it is a very common practice for us to acknowledge and show respect to the First Nations people um, in Australia and in particular on this land that I'm speaking on today. And so I'd like to share that with you. Today I acknowledge that all of our Catholic schools and offices in the Archdiocese of Melbourne are situated on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Bunurong and Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And they have walked upon and cared for this land for many thousands of years. Their continued deep spiritual connection and relationship to country is acknowledged. And I offer respect to two and four elders past, present and future and recognize our organizational commitment to the ongoing journey of reconciliation. Thank you. So it's great to be able to acknowledge our first people on this land um, and to be with you uh, on your land today. I wanted to share a little bit about me, first of all, um, and um, why today is such a wonderful opportunity for me and how special this is for me. Uh, I was born a long time ago now in Vonapulpit, Kokopo, and my parents met in New Guinea and married. And so I was born there um, and lived the early years of my life there. Uh, so New Guinea um, holds a very special place in my heart. And I'm very excited to be with you today and to connect with you all these years later. This a little picture. Some of you might recognize that hospital, uh, but um, this is um, a picture of me with my mum, uh, one pillow a week old piccaninny. And um, I traveled back to New Guinea finally some years later to find the place where I was born. And it was very difficult when I was at the hotel and they were wanting to take me on a tourist, tourist destinations, come and visit some wonderful places in New Guinea. And really the only place I wanted to go was the hospital to go and find uh, where I was born. My mother told and my father told me so many wonderful stories um, about this place and, and the people of this place. And one of the things that I went searching for was really to relive a story that my mum told me about the beautiful grounds around the hospital and that when a woman was coming into the hospital to give birth that the family would wait um, under the huge big trees on the grass gathered together as family waiting for the birth of the new child and I found that place and um, I spent the whole day uh, sitting at the hospital and uh, called my family to say that I was there. So this is a photo from a long time ago um, of the hospital grounds. And I don't know if you can see on that photo very well, but that's um, a sister riding a bicycle around the footpath of the hospital. And um, of course, on my more recent journey, I was able to see what it really looks like now. So that's a little bit about uh, where I come from. And the work that I do now is um, at the Melbourne Archdiocese Catholic Schools, and I'm the general manager of leadership development. So I work with um, principal school and system leaders on leadership development, all matter of leadership development. So we um, deliver programs to support people who are engaging in leadership, who are seeking to become principals, who are developing their system leadership skills. We run programs and we work closely with those people. 
So I'm really keen to uh, share some of that with you and, and to learn alongside you today. What I'd like you to do uh, in a little minute is to have a think about some of the current and emerging realities that we are faced with in education, some of the challenges that are apparent. I want you to think locally, but I also want you to think globally. What's going on around us? And how is that going to impact on education? So if you've got headphones on, take them out just for two minutes and have a chat to the person next to you. Now, Martha is going to be a boss leader in the room and in two minutes, she's gonna make sure you've got your headphones back on and you're back in, uh, in the, the virtual room with me. But for two minutes, have a chat with the person next to you. What are the current and emerging realities that you think you are having to work with and that are having an impact on education? Two minutes, off you go. Headphones out and have a quick chat. Welcome back everyone. What I'd like you to do is um, put yourselves back on mute, headphones in and put into the chat line some of the things that you came up with. What were some of the quick words that you came up with to describe the local and global current and emerging realities that are impacting on education and therefore impacting on us as educational leaders? Just write some of those into the chat line. All right, so while you're doing that, I might bring a couple up on the screen. I made a very quick list of a few things that I think are impacting. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, terrific comment. So we're talking about human rights and women's rights there and women understanding the, the role that they play in education and what we're seeing in young people. Thanks, Sharon. Terrific. We're also seeing in that comment the role that boys play as advocates for women. How do they enable women? Cultural beliefs. Fantastic. Thank you, Esther. Please keep the, your ideas coming. They're really terrific and we'll collate those as we come um, through the process, but please do keep them coming. I'm gonna put up on screen a couple of big picture things in our local and global environment <clears throat> that are challenges for us. Renewable energy, crime, local crime that's going on and international crime that we see that is um, apparent the protection of species and the extinction of some being the opposite of that. Displaced peoples around our world, what are we doing to support and care for refugees? Privacy and the social media trend. Extreme wealth, those people who are lining their pockets and the opposite to that being the poverty that that creates. Human rights, women's rights, advocating for women, global warming, natural disasters, keeping up with technology in our edu education space is very challenging. Recycling, data, we're surrounded by data. Freedom of speech, COVID, the pandemic that we have experienced recently has been a very complex time for all of us. So on screen, there are many, many different things that are impacting everything that we do and the experiences that we have in our leadership. And these are things that our young people are experiencing as well.
what a list. And we add all of your things into that list as well. As well. But we're not here to talk about all the doom and gloom because we have so much that we can be grateful for. We have women in leadership positions, women like you, women who are storytellers, connectors, who are keepers of the past and designers of the future. So let's have a little think about uh, the world that we're living in and our leadership practices in that space. Leading in VUCA times. I'm not sure if you've ever come across this word VUCA, V-U-C-A, and what it might stand for, but it stands for those four words that are there, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. And it suggests that we're living in times that are all of those things, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. This is not necessarily new research, um, but it's very, very specifically uh, prevalent at this time uh, as we're experiencing uh, coming through the COVID pandemic. So what does it mean uh, when we break this open a little bit more? When we're talking about volatility, there's some explanations on the screen there. The challenge is unexpected or unstable. It's not necessarily hard to understand. Knowledge is out there and it's available, but things are unexpected and changing quickly. Uncertainty, when we live in a time of uncertainty, there might be a lack of information. We might not know about cause and effect. Change is possible, but it's not often clear to us. We're, we're in uncertain times. Complexity asks us to think about the many things that are going on, the many parts. When you think about the project that you're going to design, it's going to have many parts and that makes it complex. And ambiguity. So there are things that are unknown for us. And sometimes in leadership, we have to lead during times of ambiguity, when, when we don't know, we don't have all of the answers. So what does this mean for us in our leadership? When we talk about volatility, the first one, this diagram is quite helpful because it gives us some unpacking around, well, what are the things behind volatility? What's the impact? And then what do we need to do about it as leaders? So in times of volatility, we see that there are things changing and they're changing quickly, quickly at speed. And this leads to instability, a loss of control, or perhaps increased risk. So what that needs from us is vision and a speed and accuracy around that vision, well honed skills so that we can deploy that vision with accuracy. So in uncertain times, we have unpredictability, we have surprises, and it leads to a workplace or an environment that's indecisive or where there might be delayed action because we, we're not clear about which way to go. So as leaders, we need to be able to demonstrate understanding and flexibility. In complex times, when we have multiple things interplaying, sometimes we might experience the impact of data overload or that we have to learn quickly that we're doing everything on the fly at the last minute. So when we are leading others through that time, we need to consider clarity in our leadership is so important and having a breadth of knowledge. And finally, in ambiguous times, we need to be able to demonstrate agility and self-awareness. So what is leadership for you? What I'd like you to do is have a think about what leadership means for you and put into the chat line a quick definition about what leadership means to you. What is leadership and what's your definition? While you're doing that, I'm reading some of your comments, which are just terrific. And I think we can call on these um, as we get into the presentation a little bit more. So that's really good. So what's your definition 
of leadership. I'll give you a little minute there to get some ideas in there. Thank you, Grace. Being confident and trustworthy. That's terrific. Trustworthy, being worthy of trust and demonstrating and exhibiting trust in others. Darlene, thank you. I love how you've got other people in there working together. Influence, great to see the words influence and impact. Thanks, Lena. Positively, that connects perfectly with some of the things we were talking about in VUCA times. It's hard to be positive sometimes, but we're called on to be positive as leaders, aren't we? To find the glass half full. So thank you. Please continue to share your reflections there, your definition of leadership. I'm going to share mine. Um, I was involved in the writing of a book called I'm the Principal, uh, and uh, you can see the other authors there listed on the screen. And in this book, we make the definition that leadership is a process whereby an individual influences a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. So in that definition, we talk about individuals coming together to work together, which I'm seeing in your comments, and that there is influence toward a common goal that we're all pulling in the same direction. So for you to be the best leaders that you can be, you need a toolkit. And I know that many of you already um, uh, have a multitude of experiences and, and expertise in leadership and that your toolkit is already brimming with lots of skills and capabilities. So I'm going to share with you a little uh, bit today about some other things um, or some things that might uh, need to be in the toolkit. So today for some of you, this might um, be some new learning about what you need, but I'm pretty confident for most of you, it might be a reminder about what you already have in your toolkit and you need to be reminded to draw on as you embark on your local projects. I love this photo uh, from my visit to the market um, and my thinking around this was that uh, I was seeing women preparing for the day, preparing for their families and there was a marvellous array of toolkits on offer at the market baskets to carry all manner of things and to have everything you need there at your disposal in your basket ready to call on and use when you need. So it led me to consider what's in our toolkit? What might we need as we go forward as female leaders? Well, the first thing I would like you to have a think about uh, that's really important to have in your toolkit is the ability to achieve a balcony perspective. As a leader, it's really important to create time in your day and in your week to get on the balcony and to be able to get a very clear view of the reality. So one of the things in your toolkit that's really important is getting on that balcony, being able to step away from the operational work and stand clear from it for a moment so that you can make an educated and informed decision about things that are going on locally. You can't spend all of your time on your balcony because you need to be sometimes on the dance floor and with your people. And that means really being very operational, getting into the work. So when you are on the dance floor, make sure that you enjoy it. 
Make sure that you are with your people and that you are working together to achieve that common goal. So finding that balance between balcony and dance floor is really very important. I'm sure many of you have done lots of reading and learning around the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. There's lots of research now around that it's not just one or the other, but it's more of a continuum. Now, if there's opportunity at a later date, perhaps we could do some more work on something like this, uh, understanding the growth mindset continuum. But when we look at the two that are here on the screen, think about it from the point of view of the students that you're growing, the classrooms that exist in your schools, the teachers, the leaders, your school, your system, does your system have a fixed or a growth mindset? And how might you be able to influence um, change and improvement there? So this diagram shows you that a fixed mindset is when we have a more static view of things. We might avoid challenges or give up easily. We might see effort as a waste of time. It's difficult for us to hear feedback. And we might feel threatened by the success of others. And this leads to a really fixed view of the world. No self-agency or very limited self-agency and, and little belief in one's ability to change, shape or influence the future. Whereas that growth mindset really embraces challenge, persists when things get tough. You see effort as a way to improve you learn from feedback, you find inspiration and joy in the success of others. And this really leads to autonomy and higher levels of achievement and well-being. So if it's not in your toolkit already, think about adding the need to build a growth mindset. Knowing your people and knowing your context is crucial. It's a crucial element for your leadership toolkit. First of all, your people are women. Know your women as storytellers, as creators of the future. As I said earlier, keepers of the past, but creators of the future. Know your women as nurturers who plant seeds and support things to grow. And be close with them. Find your tribe. Build those people that have those similar values. Bring them in close to what you're doing. They are your change makers. They are your connectors. It's also really important to know your context. And in our context, uh, we have um, a, a standard that sets, this diagram in particular sets the principal in the centre, but you can put any leader there, a system leader. And surrounding you is the uniqueness of your school within its own community and our diagram talks about an inclusive Australia. If you translated this into your terms, you'd be talking about an inclusive Papua New Guinea and then the global economy and society that we referred to before. So a deep understanding of your context within which you lead is really critical. Having that contextual literacy, knowledge of your surroundings, the resourcing challenges, the resources that are available to you, the outside influences where you'll go to build your networks and your mentoring relationships. It's also really important to plan. We must have this consideration in our toolkit. I'm sure you've heard of the phrase, that planning to fail, that failing to plan is planning to fail. So sometimes when we think we haven't got time to plan, that's really when we need to be planning the most. So think about planning. And I know that you're doing some planning and preparations for your projects at the moment. The planning is crucial for execution. It helps you get clear about your purpose and in your intentions, and it creates clarity for your team. It helps getting people together around that common goal when you have a plan. As female leaders, we also have to be prepared and have this in our toolkit, the ability to lead improvement, innovation and change. So you can see there on the right of the screen, the continuous improvement cycle. And there are many different cycles that you could use. This is not the only one. 
but this is a great one. So having a cycle that you use and that you apply in your local context to identify opportunities, to plan for them to happen, to execute that plan, to act out the plan, and then to review and improve what didn't go well and we need to change, what did go well and we want to keep, how can we improve for next time? On the left, I've given a little snapshot there around um, our professional standard for principles and you can see some comments that we have in there about standards of knowledge, understanding and practice for principles in the Australian context. With a particular focus on continuous improvement, innovation and change and their responsibility as leaders of our schools and our system. So an important thing to consider for your toolkit. The next one is sometimes challenging when we are having uh, difficult times, but it's to consider the need to act with unwavering commitment. Think of a time recently in your leadership where you've demonstrated unwavering commitment, where it might have been easier to give up or to walk away or to brush it aside and go on with something else. What was the context for you? Why did you hang in there? The image on the left really um, is, is, is a flag for us that while we are acting with unwavering commitment, it's really important firstly for us to know that we're in the right place, that we feel connected, respected and acknowledged for the work that we're doing and that we are in the right place in our workplace. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy though. So at times we do have to hang in there, continue in a strong and steady way, an unwavering faith. And again, going back to finding those people around us. So that really crucial factor of unwavering commitment is actually part of living in VUCA times, uncertain times. It's also part of that growth mindset that we mentioned a little bit earlier. It's also really important to have in your toolkit the skill to be able to look to the horizon. Your plan is for here, but also plan for the future. And remember that our horizon is limitless and that every ending is a new beginning. So what might that mean in your context? What's that going to mean for your project? When you arrive at your destination, at your project destination, take some time to pause. And then what are your plans for the next step? How will you move the project forward to the next stage? So looking to the horizon is about planning for now and leading for the future. Another thing to consider for your Leadership Toolkit is about seeking balance. We all know what this looks like when we think about our diet. It's not, too, it's not good to have too much of anything. Uh, it might taste good in the short term, but we, we have to deal with the challenges and the problems that come from that afterwards. So seeking balance in everything that we do is really important. Also reminding ourselves of balance between what we can control and what we cannot. I really like the comment on the left there about balance is about making choices and enjoying the results of those choices. Always recognising that we have choice and how lucky we are around to, do, to, to be able to have that choice. Balance is also about the, the scale that's there, looking at the balance of thinking and doing. And I love this next slide um, because it considers a little framework for us to think about our own thinking, learning, doing, sharing and reviewing and encourages us to seek balance in all of those spaces. We have to attend to all of those facets of our leadership and it's really hard to juggle it. So have a look through that chart. The first row, the two little row, identifies what too little thinking might look like, or too little doing, or too little learning. 
The second suggests what too much might look like. Too much thinking um, is also not helpful. It's not balanced. Too much learning means that we're really down that rabbit hole of learning and we're not coming up to apply that learning. The third row captures how we might score ourselves. And the final row is a space for us to note what we're going to do about that score, particularly if the score is too little or too much. So perhaps this might be a useful frame for your toolkit to think about. What does too little thinking look like in my context? Or what does too much doing look like for me as a leader? What's my current measure or my current score in these areas? And what do I need to do about it? So I've translated it into something like this. You might create something like this for your toolkit where you just keep this on your wall and keep a check on, well, how much thinking am I doing at the moment? Is it too much? Is it not enough? Or is it just right? And as a result of that score, what am I going to do more of or less of? And what am I going to keep just the same? I don't know if many of you have done any reading from the Centre for Creative Leadership, but they have some terrific uh, material, uh, particularly around women in leadership. And I love this slide about four keys to success being uh, that we remind ourselves of our agency, authenticity, connection and wholeness. So agency really refers to the intentional actions that we're taking towards achieving a desired goal. Taking control of our career, being your own pilot and feeling as if you're shaping your job, you're creating the success that you're experiencing. That you have agency in your leadership style and your life. You might consider taking steps toward becoming more comfortable with exercising authority, for example. Or you might make a point about seeking to practice speaking up at meetings. You might ask for the opportunity to explore a challenge that you haven't had before. You might write down your goals and share them with someone else who can help you develop them further, coming back to your project plan. Perhaps you might seek out a mentor to help you uh, in your leadership. So authenticity is really about being genuine and being yourself and resisting the urge to be a follower. Obviously, followers are really important at certain times, and we'll have a look at that in a little minute. But being able to stand up for what you believe in and hold yourself to account around that, setting some high standards for yourself and model that to those that you lead for. Your self-awareness is really important um, in the development of your authentic self. Connection is our focus on relationships and it's something that women do really well. Building close friendships and family ties underpins our ability to connect with others in the workplace. Sometimes some of the things you might want to consider are slowing down and taking more time to bring people into the, into the project with you so that you can build those relationships. And I can't stress how important it is to network for women to network and build a network of champions. It goes back to what I was saying about knowing your tribe. And if you don't have a tribe, go out and find one. So as women, it's important that in that space, we connect with others by going and finding that tribe, but also that we receive others. If we are in a tribe, that we make that space for a new person to come in and join with us. And of course, wholeness is about unity, your values, your ethos, your morals are really important to you so that in uncertain times or at times of stress, you go to your default position and you've got alignment there. So a little bit more about authentic. Uh, I would really encourage you to do some reading of Brene Brown if you haven't already. Uh, she's got some terrific podcasts and some, some great um, texts as well. Um, but this idea of letting go 
as a daily practice is something that you could consider in your toolkit. When in your day might you make one minute to just think about what you might need to let go to fully acknowledge who you are? And I love this quote by Oscar Wilde, be yourself because everybody else is already taken. So I talked earlier about follower. Followers are really important. One thing you need to know, understand and be able to put into practice when you are a leader is to bring your people with you. I don't know if you've heard this, the phrase before about getting the right people on the bus, but this is a terrific photo from the market um, when I was recently in PNG. And I just love this idea of everybody being on the bus together. They're on a journey together. So our job as the leader is to bring people with us. Have a little think about if that was your tribe in your project, where would you be sitting? In the driver's seat? In the passenger seat? On the back of the bus? Are you the last person on the bus? Are you waiting for the person who's still in the market buying their fish? Where are you on the bus? And from your vantage point, how well can you see everybody else? And how they're feeling and how they're experiencing the journey? Because some of the bus rides around Papua New Guinea are pretty bumpy. So how is that experience for everybody? Is everyone hanging on and are you that? And when you get to the destination, is the, are you creating time for celebration? So bringing people with you is really important. I've got a little video uh, which I might very quickly share about the follower because bringing people with you, that's the leader's role. The other thing that you need to do is to find the first follower. And sometimes we overlook how important this is. When you have a think about it, when you're trying to lead your project, a really important thing to do is to look for the first person who's ready to follow you. They might be a bit shy. They might be a bit unsure. How are you going to make sure that you welcome them and embrace them into your project? And this is quite a, a fun little video, but it looks at finding the first follower. Let's see if we can get this video up for you. And I'm just going to mute myself so we can put the volume on this video. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. 
If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I hope you could hear that okay. The, the video is a little bit blurry, but I'm imagining your projects and I'm imagining your followers rushing to join you uh, because of the enthusiasm uh, and the excitement that you're creating around your project. So um, I hope that that helps um, in your toolkit to consider that the first follower is so important to the work that you're doing. I also think it's important for us to think about as we look across the room at one another, you are the leader of one project. How might you be the follower of somebody else's? How will you uplift another woman in the room so that she has a great leadership experience? How might you stand beside that woman so that her project achieves success? And what sort of feedback will you give her to help her along the way? Because that's follower behavior. So our leadership behavior and our follower behavior is, is equally important. A few more slides just to finish off and I'm very conscious of time. Um, hopefully our New Guinea bus is back up on the screen. So the bus has left the market and we'll get back to our toolkit. So bringing people with you is really important. Yesterday, you heard from Mary Coverdale who spoke with you with real passion and enthusiasm about ensuring that everything we do is focused on the outcomes for young people, for the children in your care. So I think it's really important that as a leader, this must be in your toolkit. You must remember your purpose. It gives you the fire in your belly to know that your purpose, those young people, are far greater than any challenge you might be currently facing. Anyone who's pushing back on your project, yes, that's a big challenge. But your purpose is far greater than that challenge. And that will help to drive you forward, to address any fears or limitations that you might be uh, experiencing. The other thing that's really important in your toolkit is to take time to reflect, to consider head, heart and hands. Who am I as a leader? With our principles, we have a leadership journal and we ask all different sorts of questions. We create journaling time in our workshops. We ask questions like, as I start this new week, what am I grateful for? What am I looking forward to? What is something that I said or did that served my community today? Journaling as a leadership practice is a really important toolkit um, process. It's really known to have a positive impact on your well-being and it supports you to reflect. So there's some little samples here of the journals that we have for our principals in our schools. We get them to think about how many minutes of physical exercise have you done today? How many hours did you sleep? What sort of score would you give yourself um, out of 10 for your eating habits today? And have you had some mindfulness practice or some spiritual practice or time for prayer? Think about journaling as something in your toolkit. It really will help you make that leap from thinking about self-care to practicing self-care and that's the difference. It's challenging and it's rewarding. 
And to close off today, uh, it's amazing that this part of the program is, um, as I saw in Anna's program, uh, Anna's labelled it empathy. Um, and I think one of the most important things in our toolkit as female leaders is to be able to practice empathy. It's a skill that exists, we are nurturers, and I think strengthening that skill is really important. So I actually close off this session with uh, sharing with you about empathy. Leadership depends on tuning into people, talking to them in a way that they understand. A leader's empathy, though, is empty without authenticity. So we think about that authenticity we talked about earlier. Daniel Goleman has some terrific leadership advice and is a well-acknowledged researcher and writer in this space. And he talks about empathy being the hidden driver of leadership excellence. When we're skilled with empathy, we know how to firstly apply it to ourselves, though. And this is one of the challenges for us as women. We are very good at being empathetic toward others and considerate of others. But we also need to remember that being empathetic towards ourselves is very important. We sometimes feel guilt about giving time to ourselves. It's important that you fill your cup and that you have time to be the best that you can be for other people. So please think about that in your toolkit. The leadership requirement quote there is just an example of where empathy features in our principal standard here in the Australian context. Uh, if we had more time or perhaps at another opportunity, we could talk a little bit more about the empathy triad and what that means for our leadership. But there really are three layers to empathy and we call on these at different times. So it's defined by our capability and capacity to understand and experience what other people feel. We might imagine ourselves in their situation and we might see it from their perspective. So cognitive empathy is about the ability to understand another person's perspective, to see something from another point of view, not necessarily agree, but to see it and understand it and connect with it. Emotional empathy is that ability to feel what someone else feels. You know, when we watch um, someone who achieves a great accolade for doing something wonderful, and we feel that sense of pride brimming up inside of us, or when we watch a sad movie and we feel like crying. So that's an emotional empathy connection that we're making. And empathic concern is our ability to sense what another person might need from us. Not to rescue, not to solve the problem for us, but what might they need from us as that support person, as that first follower perhaps. So think about how you effectively use empathy as a leader and where your strengths are in this triad. So a little recap of all of the things that were, are in our toolkit. That ability to identify the VUCA drivers and impacts and how you need to lead in your contextual environment. Navigating the balcony and the dance floor building that growth mindset. Remember to know your people and know your context. We can't lead in the absence of context. Plan. Strive to lead improvement, innovation and change. The smallest step is a step. Act with an unwavering commitment. And some of you talked about positivity there before. Always look to the horizon, plan for the now and lead for, lead for the future. Seek balance in who you are and all that you do. Activate your agency, authenticity, your ability to connect and share your wholeness. Take time to reflect. Get the right people on that bus and take them with you. Remember your purpose and use empathy. Thank you all so much for 
sharing uh, the learning with me here today. I've been uh, really delighted to connect with you. I wish I was there in person to be able to talk with each of you and get to know you a bit more. I've left my email address there and my phone number is in the WhatsApp. Uh, I'm in the WhatsApp chat, so please don't hesitate to send me a message. Um, there are many things that I've talked about today and if there is an interest um, for some coaching conversations or some more learning about any of that, then I would, I would love to connect with you um, and, and um, understand a little bit more about your individual projects as well.